Amen, amen. God will not fail us, amen? Amen. Hey, so on one Sunday, two men walked into the main sanctuary. One man walked down the aisle to about the third row, and he found his seat. On the way, he was holding this coffee cup. He had his collared shirt on. He was shaking hands, and he had a kind smile on his face. As he settled into his seat, he began to think about his past week. And he thought about the Bible study on Wednesday that he opened his home for and, and how, how thankful people were that he was, was there and willing to host them and how, how amazed they were at his knowledge of the Bible and his wisdom in Christian living. You know, he was just, he, as he thought about that study, he was, he was very, very thankful for himself. And then he was thankful that he, he got to go to a widow's home and gathered a few guys to work on her house. Now, none of them were quite as good as he was in the, in the repair, and they were all very thankful that he was there to make sure it was done right. And then as he walked in, he was recalling how when he went and put that envelope in the, in the offering bucket, he noticed the Joneses were looking at him, and now they realize they're keeping up with him instead of him with them. You know, he was... He was, very, he was very proud of himself. And so as he settled in, he began to look around at the people. Now, being a, a smaller church, and a church in a smaller town, he knew most everybody, and he knew most everybody's business. And he said, Lord, I thank you I'm not like that, that couple over there. They're getting a divorce. I'm so happy I'm not like them. Their, their kids are always a train wreck. And I'm, I noticed that they're sitting off to the side, probably so they could sneak in and sneak out because we all know how foolish of a business deal they made. And I'm so glad I didn't, wasn't that foolish with my money. And then he kind of peeked over his shoulder and he saw the second man and he rolled his eyes. What's that guy doing here? It was the man that, that always seemed to be in the middle of problems, always seemed to be the one that just didn't seem to fit in and, and was the one that nobody wanted to be around because you might be associated with him and you didn't want that. And this, this first man was like, why is he even here? He's just gonna cause a spectacle of himself. He's probably gonna cause some problems. But that second man, he walked in and he didn't make eye contact with anybody. And he walked to the back row, the farthest seat, and he sat down and still not looking up. He didn't want to look into anybody's eyes. And more importantly, he didn't want to look up on the stage and, and see the cross that was firmly planted there. And as he began to review his week, he began to say to himself, you've, you've done nothing of any value or worth this week. All you've done is hurt people, cheat people, steal from people, abuse them, manipulate them. In fact, that's, that's what you've done all your life. And as the music began to play, tears welled up in his eyes and he just wanted to smack his head over and over again because he just felt the need to be punished. For as he began to review his life and just as the people began to sing, he's still sitting and he, and he goes, God, I've not done anything of value in my life. I've not done anything of worth. In fact, I've only hurt people, stolen from them, cheated them and manipulated them all my life. God, have mercy on me. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a similar story about a Pharisee and a tax collector. And at the end of the story, which one do you think goes home justified before God? And he said, the second one. Because in Luke 18, verse 14, he says, I tell you this. He went down to his house justified rather than the other. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. See, of the two men, it was the second that Jesus said, went home justified. And as we're in this series about living life upside down, 
We're going to talk today about how do we live in an upside down way. Because the first man in my story would probably be the one that most of us look up to religiously. That most of us would say, man, I want to be like that one. But yet, when Jesus tells the story, he's encouraging us to be like the second one. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about what does it look like for us to live upside down, different from the world, different from the way that other people live, different in the way that God wants us to be. And we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And Jesus is going to give us three examples of how to do this, but one way. So Matthew chapter 6, let's start in verse 1. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. It says, be careful, beware, be aware. He's, it's a warning. He's, I'm warning you not to do your righteous acts before other people so that they see you. And when he says righteous acts, often we're talking about, whenever, well, whenever the word righteous is used, we automatically think to... To the, the spiritual righteousness that's inside of us, that if, if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he gives you righteousness. He makes you righteous. A lot of times we think that this practices of righteousness is more of like pious deeds, devoted religious acts. He's saying, look, when you try to live out your faith, when you try to do the right things that you know you need to do, be careful when you do them in public to be seen by people. Now, you and I both know I can't be 100% private. You can't be 100% private, right? I'm looking at all your faces. I see you. You're here, right? I'll see you in the world somewhere. You know, like if you walk into a Starbucks, I might be sitting there with my Bible and reading it, right? Like there are, there are things we do that are righteous acts. And we, he's not saying we have to be 100% secret. What he's saying is be careful not to do the, those righteous acts so that people see you. For, you know, that your righteous acts are driven by people looking at you. That, oh, if I go to this Starbucks, I know this group of people will be there and they'll all see me reading my Bible. What a great pastor I am, right? And they'll think that, oh, what a great pastor we have because he reads his Bible in public. You probably want your pastor to read his Bible in private more than public, right? That's what he's talking about. Beware, be careful. You, your, your goal should not be to be seen by others. And then he, in the second half of the verse, he says, otherwise you have no reward with your Father in heaven. Guys, that's a big deal. You have no reward with your Father in heaven. He goes on in verse two. He says, so whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. They have their reward. So here's the, here's the scenario. A Pharisee is walking down a street, and this, this uh, word for street is actually means the narrow street. And later we'll see him talk about the wide street. And what he's saying is like, it doesn't matter if they're there or there, this is how they're behaving and don't do it. But he's saying, look, as they walk down the street, there's some kind of announcement that they're going to give to the poor. I don't know if it was always a trumpet. There were some times where trumpets were blown, which was calling people to give. And, and you would imagine these guys would have been at the front of the line going, hold up, everybody, let me through. I have to give, right? Or, you know, you're in a quiet room and everybody's, you know, everybody's just kind of doing their thing. And then you hear somebody cough really loud. And it's almost like they cough really loud. And then everybody kind of turns and you see them. Go, oh, here, you can have some money. Oh, sorry. Did you see that? Right. Oh, I didn't know you were looking. Right? Well, you just caught, you know what I mean? Like they're drawing attention to themselves. They're drawing attention to themselves so everybody will see how they're caring for the poor. Oh gosh, what a righteous person that, that guy is. What a religious person that is. Look how much money they're giving to the poor. He said, that's what, the, that's what the Pharisees were doing, but he calls them hypocrites. Now, what's a hypocrite? A hypocrite is not somebody who has a high moral standard that every now and then doesn't reach it, right? That's being human. As Christians, we should all have high moral standards, and as humans, we're not always going to reach it. But a hypocrite is somebody who uses religion to cover up their sin, who uses religion for self-promotion. 
The hypocrite looks and says, look, I'm going to do all of these righteous acts, all these religious acts, so that people will know that I am a good church member. So that I am a, they everybody will know that I am a good Christian. And in fact, it says this. So whenever, uh, it says, um, don't sound the trumpet before the hypocrite, or before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be applauded by people. Okay, this is, this is key, to be applauded by people. When we hear that, we imagine, oh, way to give to the poor. Good job, right? You're so great. We're applauding them. That word for applauded actually means to give praise or glory to. 80% or more of the time, it is used in reference to giving glory to God, his word, or his ministry. Which means that what the hypocrite is wanting is for you all to give him the praise that you should be giving to God. You all to give him the praise and the glory that God should be getting. The hypocrite is a glory stealer from God. The hypocrite is a glory stealer from God. Nobody likes to have their glory stolen. In fact, it's wrong to steal glory from somebody else. But to steal it from the almighty God, that is a big deal. And that's what hypocrites do. Because a hypocrite's goal is not to do right things so that people praise God, but it's to do right things so people praise them. They're glory stealers. When we act with hypocrisy, we steal glory from God. And he says, truly, I tell you, they have their reward. If what you seek is glory from people, then your reward will only be glory from people. It will not be from God. He says, so, but when you give to the poor, don't let let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. All right, so with this, this now we're given, how do we then act? What do we then do? And what, what happens here is, In verses 5 through 8, we see the same formula applied to prayer. And then in verses 16 through 18, we see the same formula applied to fasting. So as we're commanded to give to the poor, to pray, and to fast, we're giving the same formula on how to do it before God, not as hypocrites, but as God's people. And how we do it is we don't do it publicly to get praise from people, but we do it in secret. We do it in private. We don't want our goal to be seen seen by others. We want our goal to be that God sees us. Notice how it says, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. We want God to see us. We should not care about what others see. And so when we do it, we should do it in private and secret. I love the story of uh, Les Mis, Les Mis with, with Jean Valjean. In early 1800s, he was convicted of a crime. He was put in prison. And then when he was released, as society functioned, uh, convicts were kind of a lesser than person. And so he was kicked out of hotels. He was kicked out of restaurants when they found out he was a convict. They wanted nothing to do with him. And he, may, he found his way to a, the home of a bishop. And the bishop let him in and warmed him up, gave him food, gave him a bed to sleep in. And in the middle of the night, Jean Valjean woke up and stole his silverware. Now in those days and in his, the bishop's home, the silverware was actually made of silver, so it was very valuable. So this man, Jean Valjean, steals it and he runs away. Well, when the, the, the maid wakes up the next morning, she's in a tizzy. She's just, you know, he stole our silver. How, how terrible of him. And, and the bishop says, you know what? We'll just eat with wooden spoons. It'll be fine. But the police catch Jean Valjean and he gives them a fabricated story that the bishop had given him the silverware. And so the police bring him back to the bishop and they throw him on the ground in the home. And they say, they say to the bishop, this man tells us that you gave him this. And the bishop bends over and goes, my friend, you left so quickly last night, you forgot to take the candlesticks. And he goes to his mantle and he takes off two candlesticks worth hundreds of dollars and sticks them in the bag with the silverware. And he looks at the offer and says, what the man tells you is true. I've given this to him. You can release him. And the police leave. Jean Valjean is just dumbfounded. And the bishop basically says, as as I've been given grace, I give it to you. 
Now you give it to other people. And the rest of the book is about Jean Valjean's life of him giving grace to the poor and to others. That bishop could have thrown him in prison. That bishop could have said, no, what? you know what? No, he stole it, but I'm gonna give it to him for free. Like, it's fine, right? And it looks so much better. But instead, he pointed to the man, Jean Valjean, and he lifted him up. And he said, no, this is my gift to you. That's what we wanna be like. We want to do things in secret. We want to care for people in secret. We want to look into their eyes and care for people with the love of Christ that was first been given to us. That's what Jesus is talking about here. He's saying, look, don't do it in public. Do it in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And the same formula is given for prayer. It says in verse five, whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners. The street corners, that's the wide streets. They love to do that, to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Do you hear the secret again? Do you hear the same? He said, look, when you do your righteous acts, when you give, when you pray, you're to do it this way. You're to do it in secret before God and God will see it. In prayer though, he gives us a little bit more that helps explain the passage. In verse seven, he says, when you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them because your father knows the things you need before you ask him. So you have the hypocrites and the hypocrites are doing all these things to point to themselves. But then you have the unbelievers, the Gentiles, the unbelievers. And they're, when they pray, they, they, they pray to false gods. And what they think is they're like, okay, I'm, my God doesn't actually know what's going on. So I've got to, in my prayers, explain it to him. And then my God probably doesn't know the best thing for me. So I'm going to explain to them what I want. And in case my, my God is, is unclear on what I want, I'm gonna explain it in a different way so that when my God finally acts from my prayers, he will respond in the way I want to, to the needs I, I have. See, the Gentiles, they're praying to a God that, that is false and doesn't know what to do. And Jesus is saying, don't be like them because your God knows what you need before you even ask. He knows what you need before you even ask. When we do our righteous acts, we need to understand who God is. We need to have correct, a correct view of God, a correct understanding of the reality of God. We can't believe in a false God or a false reality. But this phrase, don't be like them. Don't be like them. Don't be like the hypocrites. And don't be like the unbelievers. The, the phrase, it's, 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 when it says don't be like them, that, that's, that's overly simple from what it's saying. It's, it's, it's describing this idea of don't become like them. Don't do the things that they do. Because if you do the things that hypocrites do or unbelievers do, you will become like them. It's a warning, just like he warned in verse one. He said, be careful not to practice your righteousness before others. He's saying here, be careful, don't become like them. Because if you begin to practice hypocrisy somewhere in your life, it will grow and you will become a hypocrite. And if there's anything we don't need in this church and we don't wanna become is hypocrites. But here's the reality. I've been meditating on this text all week and I don't think any of us fully understands, including myself, how much we all struggle with hypocrisy. How much we all struggle with being a hypocrite. How many times in our day will we'll go, gosh, I'm late to that meeting. Man, I don't like being late with this person because they'll think that I'm just perpetually late and, and, and they'll think less of me. Or uh, I hate it when, when this happens with my kid in public because then everybody looks at me and, and they think I'm a bad parent. Or man, if I didn't get to read my Bible this morning, if somebody asks me, I'm gonna have to make something up on why I didn't get it read because then they'll, they'll think I'm a bad Christian if I've not read my Bible. How quickly those thoughts enter our minds and mine too. They happen. 
We struggle with this. That's why Jesus gives us 18 verses on how to deal with it. 18 verses on, on don't be like them. This is something that we will fight our entire lives. We will fight hypocrisy in our, our entire lives because we just have this innate desire to want people to think well of us. We have this innate desire that we want people to give us praise because one, it feels good. It feels good. But here's the thing, when we search from it from others, it feels good for a moment, but it never lasts. You think about the artists, the musicians that have a top hit, right? And how much everybody listens to that song and then you realize 20 years later, they never wrote a single other song and nobody has a clue who they are. They hear that song and they go, oh, I know that song, but they don't know who the group is. Or I know that song, you know, but, but I have no idea who wrote it or any of the other songs. Right? And we've all been there too where, man, it is nice to get praised when things go your way. But then when they don't, the cold shoulders you get from the people around you, how much that hurts. You're the hero one day and then you're not a hero the next day. We've all experienced that. But when we start to live a life where we let hypocrisy over and over again kind of take hold of us, what we're really doing is we're placating to the crowd, we're wanting their praise. And God's saying, look, if you want their praise, that's all you're gonna get. And guys, it ends, it ends, it goes away. And that's what Jesus is warning. That reward will not last forever. But if you do your righteous acts before God in private, he says, you get a reward from me that lasts for eternity. So how do we fight this? How do, you, how do you fight hypocrisy? Well, there's three things. One, guys, we've gotta, we've gotta believe something. You gotta believe that God is real and that the reality described in the Bible is real. And what I mean by that is this, Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 32. It says, he, he did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Guys, God, God gave you his one and only son. And if he's done that, if he's gone that far, what good thing is he gonna hold back from you? God loves you. He's given you Jesus to take care of all the things that we need taken care of, that we could be with him in heaven. What in this world will he hold back from us? You live in a reality of God's goodness. You live underneath a friendly sky. And if that's true, then he will take care of all of your needs. You don't need to go to somewhere else to get them. That's the reality you live in. The second part of that is, is towards the end of that chapter. Where he says in verse 35, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, because of you we're, we are being put to death all day long, we are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. Verse 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You live in a reality that nothing can separate you from God's love. Nothing can come between you and the love of your heavenly Father. He is good and he is loving. That's the reality you live in. So if you want good things and if you want love, you don't need to go anywhere else but to him. But if you try to come to me, if you try to go to somebody else, I can only love so much. I am not a good person in and of myself, but my God is. So that's where we go. That's the reality you live in, and that's what you need to believe. Because what happens with hypocrisy is something, something shifts inside of us and an insecurity begins to say, okay, something's not right and, and, and I need somebody to tell me that I'm okay. And, and, and so I begin to look to other people and man, if I can do this thing for them or, or do that for them or do this really well, then they'll give me that little bit of praise and then I'll be okay. And then it'll be fine. But then it happens and I need it again. And I need it again. And I need it again. And just like cocaine, it's an addiction. And before you know it, I'm not standing up here preaching because I love God and I love you. I'm standing up here preaching because I need something from you. I need the pats on the back. I need you to tell me how great I am. 
And that's hypocrisy. That's not doing something in private for the Lord. That's doing something in public for myself. We have to believe that God is good and that we can get what we need from him. We have to believe that God loves you and you don't need to find love anywhere else but in him. The second thing we have to do is we have to make a decision. We have to make a decision that our only audience in our life is God. God is the sole audience of your life. What I mean by that is instead of me looking to everybody else on what to do, I can look to God and ask him what to do. Instead of me thinking about my actions before other people, I think about my actions before God and say, God, is this what you would have me do? Is this what you would have me do? God, let God be, make the decision that God would be your only audience. And how do you do that? That's hard, right? Because we have all of these messages in this world coming at us and pushing in on us. So how do we make God our only audience? Guys, what thousands of preachers have said before me, what thousands of Christians have said before me, there's two things. You gotta be in God's word and you have to be praying on a regular basis. Because God's word is where we figure out the reality. God's word is the one thing we have to describe to us what this world is like and who God is. God's word is the one thing that'll remind us about who we are and who God is. So if you are not reading the Bible on a regular basis, that means something else is building your reality. The news, people, books, music, something is building the reality in your mind and it is a false reality. It is untrue. You watch the news and the reality they build is the world is falling apart. We aren't gonna make it. Bombs are gonna go off. Governments are gonna crumble. Financial institutions are gonna fall apart. We're gonna go bankrupt. It's gonna be awful. If, that's all, if all you did was watch the news for a week, you would come out depressed. But if you read the Bible and you spend significant time every day in the scriptures, at the every day, at the end of the week, you're gonna be like, oh, God's got this. God's gonna take care of me. All I need is God's love and God's salvation. He's gonna, everything's gonna be all right because I know if this world falls apart, there's another world where I'll be, go and God will be there and he's gonna take care of me. You don't get that anywhere else from this, but, but from this book. So we have to believe in the reality of God. We have to make a decision to let God be our only audience and do that in prayer and reading the scriptures. And then finally, what happens when we do these things and we make God our only audience is those around us begin to be impacted. You think about that story with Jean Valjean. The bishop looks at him with grace. And what happens? Everybody that Jean Valjean then meets, he gives grace to, including his worst enemies. And his worst enemies, hearts are changed. I've been reading a book on a British preacher named George Whitfield, and, and in the early 1700s, England's morality and society was pretty awful. And in fact, they had this thing called the gin craze, where alcoholism, because of gin, was running rampant. And they, you can see in the histories of the laws that were being passed. They, they tried to pass laws to fix the problem. They, they tried to uh, instill higher punishments in crime. They even tried like a, a morality police. That's, a, that's my term, but where they would have people kind of roaming around and they, they would beat drunk people up and throw them into prison. You know, they would, they'd say, you're not doing the right religious acts, so we're gonna beat you up. Like they tried all this stuff to fix society, but it wasn't wasn't until George Whitfield began to preach the gospel and people's lives began to be changed by Jesus that British society changed. In this book, I found that, that once this revival happened and, and people began to accept Christ and, and, and receive the gospel and their lives were changed, the prisons were reformed, education for poor people was reformed. It's when they started the, to abolish the slave trade in England. Financially, the country was turned around. Guys, the, these things happened because people started to live out the gospel for real. They weren't just going, and the whole time people were still going to church through the gin craze. They were still going to the Church of England. They were still hearing sermons on Sunday, but they weren't living it out. 
But when God got a hold of their lives and they began to live for him and not just to make everybody in society happy with their religious acts, that's when God began to move. And it changed the people around them. And that will happen with us. That as we begin to live out the gospel before God, not before others, we are obedient to what he's commanded us to him and not to others, that's when people around us are gonna be changed. And if that happens, that's how society changes. But it starts with us, letting God be your sole audience and doing things before him and not before other people. And the way you do that is to create in your mind, to fill your mind with the true reality of Christ through God's word and through prayer. Let's pray. Father, I know there's so much more that could be said that my words are inadequate to what to to this beautiful passage and, and what you are doing. But Lord, if we walk away with anything today, challenge us to make you our sole audience, that we would look to nobody else but you. And God, you would show us how to then not be hypocrites, but be people who are driven by our love for you, by truth. And Lord, then as we do that, we know we'll give glory to you And you will change others through us. Lord, I pray that happens. Change others through us. Lord, help us to live in this upside down way. To not get glory for ourselves, but to give glory to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.